um, he changed, his ideas changed a lot uh, as the years went on. And in 1923, I believe, in a book called The Ego and the Id, he introduced what he called his structural theory of the unconscious. And this was different than his original topographical theory from 1900. And the structural theory divided the, conscious, the unconscious into id, ego was conscious, and superego, what would you say about superego? Is it conscious or unconscious? Or kind of a little bit of both. Partially conscious. Partially conscious. Okay. So the id is the huge reservoir of drives, impulses, desires, etc., that were either sexual or aggressive in nature. And Freud felt that a lot of these um, drives, as you were growing up, uh, they weren't acceptable. Um, and so he said that a lot of these impulses were repressed into the unconscious. Okay, um, that was his fundamental uh, defense mechanism. Okay, so repression was one of the defense mechanisms that Freud described. Now the superego was basically the your sense of morality, your sense of conscience. Uh, and uh, and there was usually a clash between the id, which was ruled by what Freud calls the pleasure principle. You know, as uh, Queen would say, the Queen, we want the world and we want it now. Who, who said that? I can't remember right now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like Queen. Was it Queen? Yeah, we want the world and we want it now. Freddie Mercury. Pretty um, yeah. Jim Morrison. Oh, was it Jim Morrison? Jim Morrison. Jim Morrison and the Doors. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Jim Morrison and the Doors. Uh, so the id was ruled by the uh, <coughs> pleasure principle, uh, but the ego was ruled by the reality principle. So there was kind of a clash, and a lot of these desires, instincts, impulses, Freud said, were repressed into a part of the mind that was called the unconscious. And the aim of psychoanalysis was to make the unconscious conscious. Right. And Freud said there were two ways of, uh, uh, like once those impulses become conscious, there were two things that you could do with them. You could either reject them, say, well, I'm an adult now, you know. I'm now, what, 21? <laughs> yeah, I'm now 21. Okay, so, you know, um, I can either reject those impulses, or he said you could use, I guess it's kind of a defense me mechanism, you, you could use sublimation. You could channel the energy, what he called the libido, of those sexual desires into something creative. And that's what he called sublimation. Okay. So now, in Switzerland, in the first decade, of um, uh, the 20th century, uh, you had Eugen Bleuler ensconced in Zurich running the Bergolzli uh, Institute, and you had a young psychiatrist working there called Carl Jung, 
So Carl Jung studied with Bleuler, and as Shelley mentioned last time, if you read one book on psychoanalysis, read this. It's called A Dangerous Method by John Kerr, K-E-R-R. Is that a novel? No, it's... Um, <laughs> it looks like a cover of a novel. No, it's from a film. Oh. They made a film of it. Oh. Okay. With Michael Fassbender playing um, Jung, uh, Vito Morganson playing Freud, and uh, Karen Knightley playing a patient of Jung's called Sabina Spielberg. Right? And uh, she was uh, a Russian, or she was originally from Russia, um, and she uh, became a patient of Jung's. Uh, and they ended up having some kind of uh, sexual affair, which Freud was not pleased about. And, um, and directed by David Cronenberg. Oh, yes. The film was directed by David Cronenberg. Uh, do you know David Cronenberg at all? I, w I went to school with him. Yeah. Yeah. But he was an English major. <laughs> Um, okay, uh, so Jung, uh, Jung was really of a different stamp than Freud. Uh, Freud was not religious at all. Uh, in fact, he wrote a little book later on in his life called The Future of an Illusion. He considered that religion was based on kind of a unresolved Oedipus complex. A little bit like Louis Foyer, who believed that all revolutions from 1830 to 1960 were based on unresolved Oedipus complexes. Okay, what is the Oedipus complex? Daddy issues. Mommy issues. Daddy issues. <laughs> <laughs> Mommy issues and daddy issues. You love your mother. Yeah. So, Oedipus, did anyone read the trilogy called, uh, it was by Sophocles? There was a trilogy written by Sophocles. I can't remember all three of them. There was Oedipus Rex. Oedipus Rex, that's W R E C K S. Oedipus Rex. The Oedipus Comp. So Freud saw, the, he saw the plays when he was in France. And um, he came back and, and eventually he came up with this idea. This was part of his theory of what you could call psychosexual development. Okay. So according to Freud, you go through an oral stage, you go through an anal stage, and you go through a, a well, eventually you, you come to the genital stage. Okay. Um, and for boys, for young boys, he thought that they tended to fall in love with their mothers. <laughs> And, uh, and they wanted to get rid of their fathers, okay? So what happens in, in the Oedipus myth is that Oedipus, um, unbeknownst to himself, uh, ends up uh, having a romantic relation with his mother and kills his father. So this is the kind of myth that became the focal point of uh, Freud's Oedipus complex. And he said, what did he say about girls? They fall in love with their father. They fall in love with their father. And what did he call that? The Electra. The Electra complex. The Electra complex. Now, now Electra was from a different, um, a different playwright. Who wrote the uh, Arrestian trilogy? 
Orestes. <laughs> Orestes. <laughs> uh, it was Aeschylus. Oh, yeah. Remember Aeschylus? I remember. Uh, yeah, remember Aeschylus? Okay. Well, he wrote, um, he wrote the uh, Orestian trilogy. And Orestes was Electra's brother. And then what happened, uh, his parents were, who were his parents? Anyone remember from their Greek mythology days? Uh, his parents were Agamemnon and Clytemnestra. Okay. You, you, that was on the tip of your tongue. That was in your pre-conscious, wasn't it? Yeah, right there. my distant memory. Yeah. Agamemnon. And Agamemnon uh, went off to take part in the Tro Trojan Wars, right? So he left Clytemnestra <coughs> to her own devices. Yes. And what did she do? What happens when the cat is away? The mites play. And she ended up having an affair with her um, husband's brother. Um, okay. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> guess what happened when Agamemnon came back from the church of War? Found them. His there mother, Clytemnestra, plotted with his brother to kill him. Ah. So they killed Agamemnon. Okay. And um, then. Uh, when Orestes found out, he was furious. So what did he do? He killed his mother. He killed his mother. And then Orestes was pursued by the, the Furies. They pursued him. And eventually he struck a bargain with them, with Pallas. Athena as the head goddess, and uh, he was he 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 was sort of set free basically. Um, so remember I mentioned a an existential therapist called Rollo May. Um, well, his critique of psychoanalysis was that that the Oedipus complex was not really the complex of our age. So, so Rollo May wrote mostly in the 60s and 70s, and uh, he said the, the complex of our age is the Orestes complex. The desire to make love to the father and kill the mother. Does that make any sense? The desire to make love to the father. What would Freud say about that? No, that would be the female. Well, Freud would say that's the inverse Oedipus mm -hmm. complex. That's an explanation for homosexuality, homosexuality yeah. right? Yeah. That's one of his theories of homosexuality mm -hmm. is that uh, men who grow up to be homosexual um, basically have, he called it, an inverse Oedipus complex. They want to make love to their fathers and kill their mothers. Yeah. Okay, so along comes Carl Jung, and uh, as I said, Jung was from a more religious background. First of all, he was Christian. Uh, and he um, he was interested, in, and this comes out in the film, his early studies were on word associations. Word associations. Um, but he was interested in psychoanalysis. Um, and he made contact with Freud 
1906, they started corresponding. And they had a very interesting relationship. It was very, very powerful, the relationship between Freud and Jung. For Freud, Jung was, he thought, the crown prince, the heir apparent of psychoanalysis. Why, why was Freud so fond of Jung? And then, because Jung had the connection to the university, okay? Freud had no connection. Freud's work was completely outside the university, okay? Jung had the connection to the university, and he thought, well, if Jung becomes my successor, psychoanalysis will take off in the university. And Jung <coughs> had a bit of a crush on Freud. Freud was the older man. He was 20 years older than uh, Jung. Okay? And uh, so Freud presented him with perhaps the father he never had. So they developed a very close uh, relationship. And the first time they met, uh, if you see the film, A Dangerous Method, which I'd recommend you all see, um, you'll see that uh, the first time they met, they literally spent 13 hours together talking nonstop. Uh, so, between 1906 and 1913, they had a very, very close connection. And on one of his, his excursions uh, to Vienna, Jung took along with him a younger student at the Bergotsli, and his name was Ludwig Binswanger. Remember we said he was the one who invented the first existential approach. Ludwig Binswanger. And there's a saying that goes, scratch an existential therapist and you'll find a psychoanalyst underneath. Mm -hmm. Now my first, my first intellectual love was Freud. So I was influenced by two professors. One was uh, Charles Hamling, who was a, in the philosophy department, but he was also training to be a lay psychoanalyst. And the other one was my first great love, Louis Samuel Foyer, who was also interested in psychoanalysis, but he was interested more from an intellectual point of view, trying to use psychoanalysis as a tool to understand social movements. Um, so uh, I, I decided I wanted to be a Freudian psychoanalyst. So they both said to me, well, if you want to be a Freudian psychoanalyst, you should go back and finish your medical school. Okay? Because I dropped out after two years of pre-medicine, decided medicine wasn't for me, studied philosophy for three years, got two degrees, and then I went back to medical school, finished medical school. And that's when I was turned on to R.D. Lane. And by the time I finished medical school, I no longer wanted to be a psychoanalyst. I wanted to be a Langian therapist. So, um, so this was the period uh, that Jung and Freud uh, became very close. Now, Jung's vision of the unconscious was very different from Freud's. Jung also divided the unconscious into three, <laughs> but his division was conscious, personal, con uh, 
personal unconscious. So these are things pertaining to the particular individual. But then he believed there was something called the collective unconscious. And what is the collective unconscious? Yes, uh, archetypes is certainly an important part of the collective unconscious. And what is an archetype? Archetype? I could attempt. Yeah, attempt to define an archetype. I think it is a common pattern Mm -hmm. that you can that uh, get somehow <coughs> uh, embedded into uh, almost into the biology of being uh, in yeah. the psyche um, yeah. and I can't disentangle it from our evolutionary past I mean no. these are so, so these are part yeah. of our evolutionary past yeah. these archetypes so the warrior the warrior, the, um, the hero, hero, the hero, the, hero, the mother, the hunter, the the hunter, hunter you know. Yeah. So all these are different kinds of archetypes. The visionary, the, the all visionary. these uh, Myers Briggs um, personality categorizations kind yeah. of follow like archetypes. Yeah. yeah. In fact, Myers Briggs uh, came out of Jung. Yeah. Yeah.